and we're doing it live just like that alrighty so I appreciate you making time for this interview how are you doing today I'm doing pretty good actually today is my birthday so I'm all like on cloud night right now <laughs> <laughs> nice I'm a summer kid I was born uh, June 5th so I'm definitely out of my element in in the dreary months <laughs> That's okay. It looks like you got the gear for it. You know, you you kind of gotta when you when you live in Washington, man. You, you, yeah, you either you either prep for the cold or suffer the consequences. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, that's okay. I used to actually live in Iceland for five and a half years, so. Yeah, I remember that. I I remember I remember, remember coming in, and trying to de-ice the car and everything. It's it's fun. So. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, I was, I'm just in the process. I, I was pulling up my notes for this interview here. Uh, I, they, I have them in a little file on my desktop, and I was like, well, where is it? Where'd I put it? <laughs> so you are the author of uh, Strangers in a Familiar Place. It's your debut novel. Mm -hmm. And I read it, and I quite enjoyed it. It was actually... Um, quite a, a, a refreshing read compared to some of the stuff I've been slogging through lately, let me <laughs> tell you. Um, pretty good pretty good uh, debut novel. Not perfect, uh, but it's perfection is like a unicorn, so, you know, right. <laughs> we always chase it, never quite grasp it. Right, right. So uh, before, we, before we dig into the novel, just a quick, uh, you know, who's who? You said you used to live in Iceland. What else should people know about you? What else What else is interesting about you? Um, I'm one of seven siblings. Um, I'm actually number five in the group. Um, I have two cats and a dog. Um, <laughs> I don't know. What's something else about me? I used I'm a person. To, um, <laughs> yeah, I got you it. Know, I, was like, I played soccer when I was younger. Uh, almost went pro. Almost. Um, no, daddy daddy said no, though, so. Big soccer person. Um, World Cup is my jam. Um, I love Legos. Oh, there you go. I love Legos as a I kid. I love Legos. <laughs> I loved Legos as a kid. Yeah, that was one of my favorite things to play with. Yeah, I actually, you know, because it's my birthday, my, my husband bought me the uh, old school NES uh, Lego TV build that they just pulled out. What? Yeah, I was like, oh, my God. Actually, that's what I was doing before I came on today. So I was, <laughs> I was sitting there building. I was like, I got to stop. I got to do this interview. <laughs> that's fucking cool, man. Uh, I, I, you know, that sounds dope as hell. I haven't looked at that yet, but that sounds dope as hell. I'm going to have to go to this or go to that after this because i gotta check yes. that out it, it's it's quite fun i i find i've just put together the the console part of it and i've just sat there and just inserted the because you can make the game cartridge and you can just stick it in there and put it down and put it back out and i was like been blowing it and i was like this is, drinks like so many memories <laughs> right yeah i just smelled rubbing alcohol from cleaning my cartridges <laughs> the, the nostalgia is just flooding through my synapse <laughs> <laughs> gotta uh, love it indeed uh, alrighty so um, hopping right into it uh, my questions tend to generally run um, kind of as things happen in the book I write down notes and I form questions kind of as I read through and so the one of the first things I noticed I mean right out of the gate is our protagonist Elias he's not described physically and a lot of our, a lot of, uh, I won't say that's not the right way to say that. A lot of authors do that as a deliberate choice. And I'm, I'm assuming you probably did because your book feels very deliberate. It doesn't feel haphazard at all. So I'm curious what your, what your reasoning was. It, it, it definitely was deliberate when, uh, as you read the ending of the book, of course, I won't spoil it here, but you, you find out what happens to him. And I really want it to be like if anybody read this book, um, it, it could feel like yourself. It really could. Like you, you have an imagery there. And honestly, I, I kind of played around with the fact where at first I wasn't really going to give any descriptors at all, whether this person was a male or a female. And it just got too difficult to write. <laughs> it, it really did. As for what I was trying to build, it really just got too difficult to write. I was like, I have to make it something. Um, yeah. So I chose uh, Elias and I actually, Elias is an alias for alias so 
it, that kind of a, it was a play on words on that one. So, um, yeah, that's that, that was t- intentional and deliberate because I really wanted the reader to be like, that could have been me. Well, you know, it it's further down my questions, but it's actually such a good segue. I'm just going to skip to it. Um, Elias is also Sale reversed. And Mm -hmm. Sale is the name of the fictional setting we're in. And that was a, I love clever little bits of foreshadowing like that. I didn't even notice it until I was halfway through the book. I was like, wait. (laughs) I looked at the page. I was like, how did I not notice this sooner? Yeah, I well, actually, I, I pronounce it Salee just to break it up. And probably I should have had an appendix in the back for all these names. But, you know, hindsight 2020, but whatever. Um, but yeah, that I mean, that was like I dropped like little little clues here and there as to what was going on with them. There weren't always like right in your face, um, like some of the names in the book um, uh, were like German. Um, I won't, uh, this, this part isn't, isn't spoiled, but when he goes to, you know, meet the siblings, the royal siblings, all of their names were German for their emotions. So whatever their, you know, uh, emotion that they were represented in, their name was in German. Oh, that's, I didn't see, I, I don't know a ton of German. I, I probably know a whole two or three words that actually have their origin in that <laughs> language. So I didn't notice that at all. And that's cool. I like it when I find out stuff like that. <laughs> So oh, it wasn't just that. I mean, there. That, I actually took some segues from 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 different cultures. So oh yeah, was, I noticed. I have questions yeah. about that. So <laughs> so each one of those different royalties was a different emotion, and there and it was just the emotion in German. That is, mm-hmm. that is so cool. I, I do stuff like that in my own writing. It's good to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, and and to, to finish off the question about um the Elias and the sale thing, because I had a a question about your foreshadowing um that that was a good bit of foreshadowing and i feel like that and a few other things foreshadowed your end it it was you kind of dropped breadcrumbs and it was a really um i won't say a really unique or super innovative but it was it was a fresh twist on the it was all a dream trope and uh i really enjoyed it and i just wanted to know why you chose to write your whole book in that trope um when did you decide that was going to be the end that kind of that kind of thing so uh so well i'll I'll start with the how did i decide that was going to be the end so when i wrote this book as a debut novel i I honestly i could have stretched this book out Mm -hmm. way farther Mm -hmm. um just to give more backgrounds for people and everything but I felt like if I went too far with the characters, not many people would take a chance on it because the book could have been much longer. So I kind of set like a limit for myself as to like, OK, I literally said 10 chapters. You got to end in 10 chapters, you know, like don't go any farther than that. I don't care how many pages are between those chapters, but 10 chapters, you're done. So I kind of set a limit on myself just so I wouldn't overdo it kind of thing. Um, but as far as the dream trope, it actually kind of took place within himself. Where, where it kind of based itself out of is when people have these out of body experiences, you know, they like, they say they're their mom, their dad, they, some people say they went to heaven or hell or whatever, all this stuff. And so the book is kind of be like, well, what kind of happens when you do go into that dream state? So it, it wasn't necessarily a dream state as it was like more of like the 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 spiritual astral plane kind of self thing so i just took a kind of like a fantastical twist on that idea of like okay this dude is dying you know kind of thing and how how does he get back you know from that that yeah see and and that was really to me it it was definitely like i said an enjoyable i I just enjoyed the end it was i it was foreshadowed enough that when i got there i was like oh yeah that makes sense and it was a satisfying conclusion but it wasn't so obvious that i felt like i was spoon fed it or anything i i i liked that so let me let me jump back here to (laughs) now i got all out of order now i'm all messed up (laughs) my bad oh no hey these things you know they go the way they go um and so um another another question that I came up immediately, literally as soon as I read the description of your monster when he first enters, uh, how did you pronounce it? Uh, Sully. 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 It's kind of a French. Sully. Okay. (laughs) Sully. All right. (laughs) Sorry. I'm ridiculous. Um, 
right when he first is exposed to the monster when he's laying in the snow i immediately felt like this was a metaphor for mental illness is that mm-hmm. something i'm just projecting onto the book or am i onto something with that so that wasn't necessarily for his mental illness part of it um that was the representation for death in okay. there like you know based on what happens with him the very first thing that happens to him like for example he's in a snowy area you know he feels cold well what happens when you die you know your your body gets cold and you turn blue and that kind of thing so the snow is kind of the representation of like him losing himself almost and then death was coming after him to kill him gotcha. um so that's where that came from so i didn't focus necessarily on the mental aspect of it in that way um his 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 kind of battle is just coming to grips with like dude this this is my life and i need to live it you know i I want to live it kind of thing and there is something that you know that i need to hold precious well yeah and like i said i was wondering because i i saw that it might be that angle too and so i was wondering is this me projecting on the book or is this what the author meant and so i had to ask (laughs) because it's the the way you write it it's it could go either way I could definitely see it being about death or being about depression because the language you use, it sounds a lot like um, a lot of people's way of describing depression. And so mm-hmm. I, I was like, that, that I just have to ask about that because it, it could really be either way on that one. Um, and then you mentioned you mentioned cultural influences, and I noticed some of them. I'm not completely. I'm not completely. Uh, tunnel vision on my own culture i feel like i noticed a lot of east asian uh uh, Mm -hmm. not references but cultural references and i i I kid you i don't know if you've um ever watched any um studio ghibli films i love studio Ghibli. yeah there there were there were sections i was reading i was like i feel like i'm watching a ghibli film (laughs) so, <laughs> oh that's awesome yeah that's like a huge compliment for me so thank you <laughs> yep. yeah I, it was specifically the the bath scene when he was staying and uh, M- uh mirin as she was known yep. at the time walked in and was and was teasing him with the whole clothes thing i was like man this this whole thing just feels like a, a ghibli scene <laughs> It feels exactly good because the Japanese, they have the, 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 I, I don't want to say prudish, but they have their, their rules of decorum where nudity is concerned and what they deem proper. Mm-hmm. And it came, that kind of idea of cultural decorum came through in that particular section of the book and then the outdoor bath and yeah, I would, so yeah. I yes, definitely... I, I did, I did take some, I, I do love Japanese culture. Uh, I'm also an anime fan. They couldn't guess by the Studio Ghibli. But yes, I'm also a, an anime fan. But um, uh, as some of the other cultures I took from was not only uh, Japanese, but German, um, Arabic. Actually, the bear's name, Malak, actually comes from Arabic. Um, so his name was Arabic. And um, there was one more, Hebrew. I took another one from Hebrew. So there are a couple different ones. Let me, was, was the Hebrew name the uh, Lucille? No, actually, Lucille was just a nice little play on words. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I I was trying to be, like, not so necess- necessarily in your face, but the book does take a kind of C.S. Lewis kind of turn to it, where it is based off of the biblical principles. So how I got the backdrop for this is I kind of thought of, okay, Satan falls out of heaven, and he took a third of, you know, the the angels with him. I'm, I'm pretty sure, I mean, nobody talks about it, but I'm like, what was the dynamic of friendship between the angels that, that fell mm-hmm. and then the angels that stayed behind between God? So that's kind of like the, the backdrop for what I used to explain kind of Malox and Lucille, which is was supposed to be playoff for Lucifer. So I just look like, Lucille, Lucifer, it works, whatever. Literally, so. literally my next question was about uh, biblical influence because I really feel like you could make a direct... I, I was like, okay, well, Lucille, or Mao, as he renames himself, is 100% analogous to Satan. He's the deceiver. He's the silver-tongued. He, he's described as being beautiful. Lucifer was supposedly the most beautiful angel. I was like, 
He's Satan. <laughs> and then, He's definitely Satan. <laughs> and then Moloch is described as being a warrior and fiercely loyal and a protector. And I was like, well, that sounds like Michael the Archangel. Well, um, the, well, I, I didn't necessarily see him as Michael, um, but he his name is actually derivative from the Arabic for angel. So that's how my lot kind of came came below. I, I absolutely love his name. I love his name. Um, but I did I did wanted that you know that bond between them to be particularly poignant you know for mm-hmm. Malak um, to kind of to kind of get through that hurt and kind of you know figure out what was going on with him in addition to why it was hurting Elias you know during the whole journey and everything it it had to be something significant so when I chose a backdrop you know I am a Christian not afraid to say all that but I I wanted a story that you know made you think about choice you know maybe you necessarily and i'm like again you could be jewish catholic methodist you know muhammad whatever the point of the book is to make you think about the afterlife you know like what what choices are you making in your life that will affect you in the afterlife i just chose it to to uh you know model it after my own you know basic christianity but it is to get you to think about like hey what am i going to do when i die kind of thing yeah and and also definitely um, what am I doing w- with my life while I'm here? That's also right, definitely that also a solid too. theme. Because I mean, he in, right in the beginning of the book, he's like, uh, you know, saying to himself, "What does it matter if I die? I just drift through life anyways. There's no real point." And then by the end, he decides he decides, well, no, I can make something of my life. I don't have to let my parents live my life for me. I can make my own decisions. So yeah. that's he definitely grows into himself by the end of the book. And, Most definitely. and okay so uh like i said the book is not perfect and so now i got some 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 slightly pointed more hard-hitting questions for you because I, I can't just <laughs> i can't just let stuff that i notice that's wrong go unchecked um but it, it's nothing like super heinous or anything so don't don't feel like i'm about to drop a nuke on you so i got you so in the beginning of the book uh and there actually might be an explanation you might explain this one but i want to hear what you have to say <laughs> Um, in the beginning of the book, when you're setting up the, the journey, the, the premise of the adventure, we were told there are five pillars, and I can't remember how you exactly lined them out, but there were I distinctly remember there were five pillars, and by the end of the book, we've only retrieved four. And so my question is, was that uh, an, a developmental editing oversight, or was Elias the fifth pillar, or what's... So there's five, the, and, and the thing that probably kicked me in the butt, and you're right, this was a slightly oversight on my part as far as I didn't want to just say, okay, now I'm going to the next pillar, now we're going to the mm-hmm. next pillar, now we're going to the next. I didn't want to get into that that repetitiveness yeah. stuff. But, so some of them I didn't name, but they were actual pillar events. Like, for example, the one I didn't name would be when he was with the fairies and he was exerting his own will, uh, you know, as to what he was going to do and what they should have done. That was a pillar, you know, the mind, the will and the emotions, um, you know, the emotions were the siblings, the the mind um, or the, excuse me, the physical part was Yiddick. Um, the soul was him at the end, you know, where he, he really touches himself and that's that's that part so there are other there are other places in there where i have it in there i just don't necessarily just come out and say it's not explicit you kind of yeah it's just not explicit and and again on hindsight i i could have done that a lot better as far as you know maybe just putting more emphasis on it or at least saying you know or having some character acknowledge it Mm -hmm. um as a pillar um but it's there i just don't explicitly say it got it (laughs) got it and and like i said i really would have settled for the explanation of well he is the fifth pillar just Mm -hmm. him content just him pushing through the journey and making it to the end that whole thing was the final pillar and that either you know your your answer satisfies me that would have satisfied (laughs) me there's a few ways i came up with in my head that could have explained it away um so it's not this big glaring irreparable hole or anything (laughs) no 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 but i mean if if there was one thing that i would love to redo about the book it would be just defining those pillars a little more you know just making sure that not necessarily giving it fanfare but 
even if I don't say it in the beginning, like that's what you did, someone else, you know, of significance would be like, yo, you got that pillar. Good job. Just, just go, you know. Uh, same, same vein, um, in terms of, um, I, it may have been in there, but I didn't quite catch it or maybe it was a minor oversight on your part. Um, when the cloud leopard, whose name is escaping me right now, um, sends him on, sends him on those errands to get the pillar of the physical, he was supposed to do three tasks. And he went and got the bow from Yedek, and then he went and got the flower, and that that's only two. So what happened kill to the, the board? Kill, kill the boar. Oh, killing the boar was the third task? Yeah. yeah. Okay. See, yeah, I that that was on my part then. I I for some reason in my mind going and getting the flower from the boar and killing him was just the same because like you're not gonna get the flower without killing it, so it's the same task. <laughs> so alright. I could yep, that's reasonable. <laughs> and then we talked a little bit about this already but besides the the language and the names uh what other kind of research went into this book so um i actually based it off of the the the, the idea other than you know having a backdrop of it but the nut the, the kernel or nugget came out of uh, when i was about nine or eight or so I had an out-of-body experience where I remember sleeping on my dad's lap or falling asleep on my dad's lap and I can just remember vividly seeing myself I can remember every detail I can even remember what he was watching which was the news it's always the news but um um I just nothing significant or or you know fantastic happened it just happened um, it only other happened one other time that I can think of before I was 12, before I, I, I never had another experience like that ever again. So I've only experienced it twice. But that really did get me thinking about the whole, like, what is, what is you know, the soul, the mind, the body, you know, what, what makes up our human self. So I did, you know, do a little bit of, uh, you know, psychological research, you know, some research on, you know, what they say the spirit is made out of. And there was really the, you know, the five pillars that we ended up naming really kind of stood out as sort of like an overarching theme through it all of, of what makes up the human. Um, so that's what basically we based it off of and then pairing it with the story of, you know, uh, Lucifer falling out of heaven, it kind of came together from there. Gotcha. You know, it's funny. That was one thing that I thought about when I was reading your book was you, you break it into five sections. My personal philosophy has always been that there were three. A human is three parts, mind, body, and soul. Um, because in my, in my mind, will is kind of not so much a pillar of the human as it is a byproduct of the soul and the mind meeting. And so mm. I, I just frame the human being a little bit differently, but I, I definitely see the five pillar argument too. And so that was, that was one thing when I was reading the book that I really thought was interesting was how you define what makes a human. I, I definitely saw that come through and it, it's, it's an interesting little bit of philosophy. Yeah. yeah you know, it, it, it's, it's one, one of those things, things where, where, but life, life is really kind of strange. Not to quote the TV show or anything like that. But life, life is really kind of strange. Yeah. And when you, when you kind of compartmentalize these different aspects, well, for me, when I was thinking through it, I was like, well, you don't make a decision without your emotions being involved one way or another. Mm -hmm. And you know, whether or not you make a decision, you have to have the will to carry it out. You know, and you, you have your mind, your body, your soul, and your heart, and everything like that. You know, that kind of contain all these things. So for me, it was really just kind of sitting down and like, well, can these things be separated? You know, like the, it, when you think about, you know, when you just came up with the three, I was like, well, let me sit down and think about these five. Like, are they interconnected like these people say they are? Or is it just like, like you said, just your mind, your body and your soul? And when I really did sit down and think about it for me, I was like, I could kind of see for myself, like, yeah, you're right. You know, I, I do make an emotional decision every once in a while. You know, I say I'm going to do something, but normally I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, like, or, you know, I'm going to lose weight tomorrow. That never happens. So, so I can kind of like see how all this stuff was working together. So at the end of the day, that's how we came up with the five. Gotcha. 
and uh, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna move away from some of my uh, formal questions and just bring up some notes I I uh, had here that I wanted to just mull over with you. Um, do, do, do where? Hmm. So one of the things that struck me pretty initially was that we're, we're obviously in a fantasy setting <clears throat> but it kind of reads uh almost like a fairy tale at first almost kind of almost like a brother's grim style fairy tale was that deliberate or is that just kind of you is that just kind of the way you you write that's just that's, that's just me honestly gotcha. um uh, as someone described my writing it was like uh i'm trying to quote him correctly but he's like Berica, you write enough to where I can get the picture, but you leave a lot to my imagination, to where I can come up with something far worse or better, you know, de depending on what you're leading me to. And, and you know, he's like, I, I really like that. And I do like that. I like the fact that, you know, in, in some cases, for things that I want specifically you to know, um, it, it was this color or it was this thing, especially if it has a meaning to it. I like to leave it to you to kind of imagine. Give you enough pretext there that, you know, it's not a blank slate, but kind of bring you to it on your own. Yeah, that's a that's a pretty commonly seen technique in contemporary fantasy is I'm going to give you enough to where you're not in a white room, but let you fill in the details. And yeah, I, it... I definitely filled in the details as being very fairy tale esque, almost Disney movie esque. <laughs> it was yeah, that's just how. Like I said, uh, or, or or Ghibli esque. Like that's that really is when I read it. I that's the vibe I get. Well, I, 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 like I said, I'm hauled down if you think it's a Ghibli movie. Do you want to call Ghibli Studios and be like, yo, this is your next book right here? Hey, yo, bro, you need to license this. <laughs> right? Down for that. Merchandising and everything. <laughs> um, what, another thing that, and this is one of the things that I was like, oh, man, I feel like that could have used a little bit better execution. The the thing with Yetic. Um mm -hmm hit the build up to that and and the the scene itself i feel like if you'd spent a little more time on that and gave it a little bit more fleshing out it really would have landed but you as you just said you were trying to keep the book on the shorter side is that why he didn't get more build up and and such uh, honestly well, as far as character development goes yiddick is probably one of my favorite and also creepiest ones like yeah. he creeps me out and at the same time i really like his character but yes he's one of those ones i felt like i try it was definitely a compromise there that i had to come up with because i didn't want to put too much emphasis on yiddick and his story to where it would overshadow the over arc mm -hmm. and in in his his story really wouldn't go anywhere kind of thing right um unless i fleshed out everybody you know and kind of you know gave a, a nice little background so it was Enough, enough to get, get you to like, like here's, here's the significance of what Yiddick is, what he did, how he got, got here, and if we kind of had to be like, okay, we're done. <laughs> you, can't you can't really go. So again, um, some of the story does lack just because of the constraint I put on myself. Mm -hmm. um, definitely for the next story, I have no constraints on myself. So everybody knows me now. They know what I've written kind of thing. So like, if they like it, then you can check it out. They like that. They can, they can you know get into some meatier stuff but some, some of the characters i really did want to to flesh them out a whole lot more than what they got and just because of the constraints i put on myself they they kind of had to get get job but <laughs> you know i i'm gonna throw i'm gonna this wasn't in my notes but i'm just gonna throw this one out to you your your end is my apologies that is not intentional <clears throat> sorry <laughs> um well i will uh, right i'm gonna throw this out to you because your end isn't definitive it's not like this is the end no more everything's done you could make a sequel he could definitely return to sale and then yedic and all these other characters could get that fleshed out treatment is that something that you would consider doing so, so Yes and, yes and no to that, to that question. question. Um, 
when so I when I got done with the book, the book it was, it was I, re- I, re- I re- honestly it was mostly because of Malak because I really love Malak. Um, and I was like, I just, I would like another story with him along the same premise, except slightly different. Um, so I, I am writing a, a sequel to it. It's an indirect sequel to the story. There will be references to the first book, but you wouldn't have need, needed to read the first book in order to jump into this one. Um, I, I'm, so I'm almost pretty sure I can tell which, what, what direction you go with it. So, so oh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty different, different with this one. Uh, this one, this one, this one doesn't necessarily, this one goes more, okay, to, to another mental aspect or emotional aspect. I remember you were talking about like, um, uh, depression as being a, uh, you know, a possible hint in there. It's not depression this time. We're not going that, but I'm going in another facet that's kind of like depression. So, well, see where I don't want to give it away. Right? Where I thought you, where I thought you might be going with it is a, a continuation of the, the the mouse chasing the cat, <laughs> as it were. Yeah. yeah so, um, it, it, it again, it's kind of in the same vein, but I wanted a a, a fresh story. You know, mm-hmm. like I I did not want necessarily to go down that path because I figured Elias was pretty much set. You know, like he's. He's, I felt, I felt that, that for me. I was like, you know, you know what? what? I'd, I'd love to flesh out the story. I'd love to redo the story. But for what it was, I, I, I feel pretty solid about it. Yeah. So I wanted a, another indirect story in it. Around, again, same basics and premise, just with a new twist in it and just a new spin on it where you can see the difference between the two of them. It's correlated, but there's a difference, you know, stark difference between the one and the other. Yeah, I definitely... I I'm gonna have to check that out because I one thing probably the the most irritating thing about your writing was there were definitely a lot of things that could have gotten a more fleshed out treatment and it would have made the book quite a bit longer but I wanted to see them fleshed out and they just it was the book stayed short I mean to be to be honest I I think if you if your goal was to write like a a series and you came up with enough filler arcs you could have made this story into like three or four books like almost like a harry potter-esque series in this grand journey to find the self and recover from well not to, not to spoil but yeah and but you were like nope keeping it short debut <laughs> which is the opposite of what i did yeah <laughs> no i mean honestly I, I honestly i probably would have made four or five books mm-hmm. and they probably each would have been the pillar yeah. like just to represent each yep. one and each each book would have really gotten fleshed out i didn't actually start it that way it was actually just supposed to be one full book all the way through so that's why i was just like dude this is gonna be like some thick Gerald token looking thing by the time I get done I was like I people aren't gonna take a chance on this you know unless unless it's you know fight size you know kind of thing so again it was one of those things of yeah yep that you you had to compromise with yourself somewhere I hear you next book I'm I'm totally not compromising so it's gonna be as long as is whatever I deem fit it gonna be yep I yeah you know, I I was not aware of the constraints on length when I was drafting mine, and I ended up around 145k, and it was done. And I started going into research mode and finding out what it takes to get published. And then I landed at the realization that it, my book was way too long, and I was like, I'm not cutting it. <laughs> It's like I'm not not doing it. We'll write another one. Nope. And then we'll. Nope. Just not gonna cut it. It it is exactly as long as it needs to be, good sir. Right. right? So. Yeah. It 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 was it was definitely hard. And, and again, in some areas, I agree with you as the author. The book kind of suffered as far as story goes. Just just didn't feel fleshed out but at the same time i like what you're saying because you wanted more Mm -hmm. so in in the same instance it still gives me like a good feeling because i'm like okay i i what for what i did gave you yeah you still want more yeah like like i said the the really the worst thing about it was it didn't get more fleshed out especially yiddick he was such an interesting character and 
my own work concerns madness so much. It's it madness is one of the things that fascinates me. And so his character was intensely compelling to me. <laughs> and not to mention there was just the way you described him was very in encapsulating and you captured a unique brand of madness. And that's something a lot of people don't understand is we have all these labels that we give to people who are mentally ill and we, we think when we label them, we, we now understand what's wrong with them. And I respectfully disagree. <laughs> Every brand of madness is a slightly different flavor. And Yiddick Just definitely slightly. had his own flavor. And it was, uh, it was very, it, the word I like to use when it's, when a character is fleshed out is alive. The character was alive mm. on the page. Yeah, yeah. I, Yid, Yiddick yeah. again. He was, he was one, one of my, my I guess, second, second, second to Malak. He definitely, definitely comes in at the second most favorite character, character just because, because of his his background, his background and that whole crazy, crazy maddening, maddening obsession, obsession with cutting, cutting and hurting himself, himself kind of thing. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are a couple parts where I'm just like, Ugh, okay, <sighs> all, right. all right, we can do this. Just don't read it. Just don't read it back to yourself. Just, like, just don't read it back to me. So, I mean, and, and actually, I had to kind of scale get it back because I, I honestly got to a point where I'm like, okay, Derek, I can't, I can't write. Like, I can't, I can't edit this part and whatever. And it, and it is for a certain audience. So, you know, bring it back. Yeah, got to gotta dial this in. Got to gotta yeah. restrain it a little bit. All righty. Well, I mean, unless there's something else about the book that you feel the aching need to, to inform me about, um, we're gonna we're gonna start the close up which uh, so my my final question that i like to ask people is what is the one question about your work that you always get asked that you just want answered on the record so that it's done and you can refer people to this interview and say go watch it it's at the questions at the end i'm not answering this in person again how do you how say malak's <laughs> name it's Malak, it's Malak. Not, Malik. not Malik, not Malachi, <laughs> not, not what, Malice, uh, not Malachi, not, not Barachi, it's, it's, it's Malak. Malak. Uh, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> that's very funny, and here's why. The very first interview I did for my channel was with uh, the wonderful Nikki Hicks, She and she wrote this uh, collection of short stories for... Uh, a detective in the supernatural realm and it's a very good bunch of short stories and, and Nikki is delightful and I asked her the same question because that's my end of interview question and her answer was how do you say Jake Ishtin Hedgie's name <laughs> <laughs> because and it, we had a whole rant about it because his name is spelled out phonetically in the narrative I think four times in that book. She literally gives you like hooked on phonics style how to sound out his name. And <laughs> and so when she said that was the question she got most often, I was like, but it's in the book. Right. right? Four times. <laughs> uh that you, yeah. you should have included that index in the back with a lot with a, I, I should have you know and, that, and that's why you know i i, I give people a whole ton of grace that's like because I, I, I hey i got you guys i, I didn't put the appendix that's my bad but his name's name malak you know it, i was i wasn't super far off i think in my head when i was reading it i was saying um well, not i was saying uh malik, malik. yeah malik i wasn't yeah. i was le i was leaving the h because I was like, either the H or the K is silent, so it's either Mala or Malik. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Malak is how you say his name. And and you said that's Arabic. Mm -hmm. That explains it. Yeah, they they really like their their their. The, 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 the I can't I can't even do it because I don't speak. It's the the the. So I, yeah. I'm, I just I just sound uh slightly slightly racist right now, so just stop. <laughs> So, uh, that that is funny that that it, it was the name thing. I swear, <laughs> if if I publish my book and someone and the number one question is how you say my protagonist's name, I'm 
I'm gonna lose my shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that honestly, out of all the things I get, the number one question I always get is how you say my last name. That is ridiculous. Yeah. All righty. So, where do people go to find you? Where do they go to buy your book? All the things. Cool. So I am on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook page, Stranger in a Familiar Place. My Twitter is at Verica Smith. Um, I try to tweet once a week, give or take. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, and I'm also on Instagram as well. And that mostly is just for like books I find, books I find enjoyable, enjoyable. and sometimes I will post about my own book but sometimes I'll be like oh y'all, y'all read this book just at some point um, um that's what my YouTube's for. and they they can also buy my book on Amazon Barnes and Noble the Apple store um it is on the ebook version both on the Nook and the Kindle store um and uh yeah ebook on Apple too so yeah well I can't I can't promise all those things will be linked in the description because that was quite that was a good chunk of things but a few of those things will be linked down in the abyss that is the youtube description <laughs> that uh few few dare tread these days uh and i i gotta tell you I, I look forward to the next one um i definitely think you you got you got talent and i i enjoyed reading your work and uh yeah i <sighs> It could have been three books, man. <laughs> it it, it could have. It could have. I, I it so, so agree with you. Uh, it, but maybe next time you'll get a series out of me. I'll, I'm definitely going to write this indirect sequel, but um, then we're, we're going to work on um, another series that I got popping in my head that I need to get out on the page. But Lovely. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I'll tell your friends. Yeah. I, well, you know, again, that's what my YouTube's for. <laughs> I like uh, I like coming on here and, and supporting good work and and critiquing bad stuff that's that's what we're here to do and you definitely are much more the former than than the latter uh so yeah pleasure pleasure speaking with you thank you for making time uh thanks for the free book and uh be well thank you so thank much you so much for having me i appreciate you all right catch you later